Hi. So uh, I'll just uh, break down the, the topic a little bit before um, I have my speakers come on board, make sure the stage is set for them. So um, thank you for all coming. Uh, the name of our um, panel is Transforming Industries by Creating Healthy Ecosystems, Strategic and Operational Challenges. So um, thanks for coming, and I genuinely mean that. Uh, I put myself in your shoes a little bit, and I hear a title like that, and I think there are a couple of reasons why I may not show up. The first one has to do with the fact that we're wedged in that weird time where basically we are going to be standing between you and lunch, which is always a, is a difficult thing to do. And uh, the second thing is because, let's face it, a topic like that has really high bullshit potential, right? And, I, and I've been burned before. I've been on several panels that have something like this. And what, is, what usually happens is that you have, you know, a corporate or a public institution that is doing a kind of fluffy infomercial, parading some of the greatest uh, things that they've done in open innovation with the ecosystem, whatever that means. So... <gasps> <laughs> well, well, there isn't much I can do about the lunch issue, I can help you out with a second because we have some really incredible speakers who are going to tell it like it is. So uh, can I call all the speakers to, to the stage? So I'll introduce them all one by one. Okay, come here. So I'll go, I'll go in, this, in this direction. Um, so I'm going to start with, uh, this is um, Ronald Cleveland. Yes, thanks. I got it. I was practicing pronunciation a while ago. So Ronald founded um, the Crowdfunding Hub, which is a research institute for applied research and consultancy on alternative finance for national and local governments, NGOs, and financial institutes. But he's also a senior advisor for the European Commission on Alternative Finance, co-founder of the European Crowdfunding Network, and part of the Cambridge Alternative Finance Industry Leadership Board. So in case you haven't guessed it, uh, Ronald is, Ronald's big thing is the future of crowdfunding and community finance. Um, we're gonna move on next to Rodrigo Baggio. So in a former, maybe perhaps more corporate other life, uh, Rodrigo worked as an artificial intelligence specialist for Accenture and, for, um, and managed IBM's reinventing education programs. Today, after seeing the light, if I can put it that way. Um, Rodrigo is now the founder and president of the Center for Digital Inclusion. Now, for those of you who haven't heard about uh, the CDI, it's a global NGO headquartered in Brazil that focus, focuses on digital empowerment. Now, along that journey, Rodrigo had, has bagged over 60 awards um, from um, Time, from Fortune, from UNICEF, but I have a favorite, I was looking at the list, and my favorite is the Entrepreneur for the World Award, which you know is not a city, is not a country, it's not a continent, it's the world. So I thought that was pretty neat. Um, and last but not the least, we have uh, Frederick Oru. Um, has anyone from the room never heard of Numa before? Yeah, that's what I. Oh, do you want a quick, quick intro? Very quick intro in one sentence on what Numa is. And then okay. I'll uh, we're a real place. We, are, uh, we make corporate startups and uh, uh, let's say entrepreneurs at large work together in uh, big, um, let's say, buildings in the center of the cities in Paris, right in Le Sentier. You can come, uh, you're welcome, but also in Moscow, Bangalore, uh, Casablanca, Mexico, Barcelona. Okay, great. I, I asked Fred to explain it because Numa is such a fast paced and quickly evolving um, institution that I somehow never know if I have the, the definition right. So, um, so now that you know a bit of Numa, so um, Frédéric is kind of like the Captain Kirk or Picard of Numa, depending on, you know, how you want to go with it. Uh, his job is to kind of boldly take this French accelerator uh, and consultancy where no, um, you know, other French institution of its kind has gone before. So India, Russia, Morocco, Spain, and more recently, Mexico. I'm not mistaken. So his mission is to expand Numa into these new geographies. While that may sound a little daunting, um, Fred is a seasoned international project manager with 13 years in IT and training services under his belt. There we go. All right, so, you know, let's, let's cut to the chase. Um, it's a difficult topic, right? Because we, it, it's very wide and, and a little boundless. So we're going to start with, uh, with the beginning, which is 
what on earth is a healthy ecosystem? What is an ecosystem anyway? And what is a healthy ecosystem? Um, so I, I looked it up before um, coming here, you know, traditional Wikipedia definition. And it is a community of living organisms in conjunction with the non-living components of their environments. Things like air, water, and mineral soil interacting as a system. So gentlemen, on that note, um, could you, could you tell the audience a little bit about what your vision of a healthy tech ecosystem is? Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's start then. And of course, my background is from financial point uh, because with a lot of these discussions about healthy tech he uh, ecosystems or ecosystems in general are always how to set up an uh, accelerator, how to mentor them. And I think my fellow panelists know much more about it, so I will not inc uh, go into that. I will uh, ask you to go into that. I'm focusing more on the financial part because that's the last part and I see that most of that is not being covered uh, in the current ecosystems. Current ecosystems are still depending on traditional finance, for example. Traditional finance, either be bank finance or business angels, venture capitalists. And most of the time that's really not a very uh, healthy situation because the large financial institutes, they have the money, they have the power and it's quite difficult for you as a startup, as a tech startup, to approach them, to find them. And even if you have accelerators, great accelerators, help you find that connection, mm -hmm. it's still difficult for you to have a very an even uh, discussion with them. And so what I think when it's really healthy means that you create a bigger ecosystem around your tech ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You create a network of investors okay. that can be your clients, that can be your uh, uh, co-owners, for example, mm -hmm. they will finance you, but they will also benefit from all the profits there. Okay, so, so inc yeah, also financial inclusion there. Okay, so healthy tech ecosystem equals um, diversity in terms of capital and in terms of funding that not only includes traditional players, but also all of the different kinds of alternative funding. Yes, I get yes. it. Great. Um, yeah, for me, a uh, health ecosystem uh, for technology is a nice combination with uh, uh, entrepreneurs, investors, social entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. with balance of gender, color, and stimulate people in uh, being inclusive in all of this uh, process. And also, uh, for me, a, a health ecosystem for social entrepreneurs uh, is a uh, uh, an ec ecosystem to stimulate innovation, disruption, but uh, access to funding, uh, balance, and quality of life. Okay. So, and uh, yeah, I think it's... Excellent. Balance and quality of life. I think that's something we do pretty well in France, so we're good. <laughs> Fred. Yeah, well, I, I think the main point is uh, indeed diversity. Um, it's really not just about entrepreneurs um, creating startups, but also uh, freelancers, experts, people, in, uh, researchers, students, uh, any kind of guys. And uh, that's, that's something that we work a lot of because we are perfectly uh, convinced that innovation uh, comes from diversity. Uh, and and I, I would say that a good ecosystem is a, is a kind of messy. Uh, if it's too much structured, or if it's predictable, then it's not an healthy ecosystem. It should be a bit messy. It has to be messy, yeah, we like the mess. So, okay, so I noted some of these down. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to enumerate just a bunch of some of the usual building blocks of what a health healthy ecosystem is. I'm gonna ask you to pick one, which you think may be the most important, and then based on your background, kind of elaborate on that. There are no trick questions, I promise. Okay, so. One is entrepreneurial education. Two, government support and subsidies. Three, access to risk capital. Four, cultural role models, which ties into gender a little bit. Um, access to corporate contracts for pilots. Uh, local skills and talent. Active exit markets. Or none of the above. Do you want to start? So I start. Um of course, access to finance sounds the, the most <laughs> uh, logical one there. Um, uh, because what, what I think was very important, and that also reflects to this number one, uh, uh, to education. Um, what I noticed is that for a lot of entrepreneurs, um, they don't know anything about uh, how to finance their, uh, their company. And of course, with a lot of other things also, uh, they don't know yet. But that's, uh, it goes even further, because most of the accelerators and the incubators I'm teaching, I'm training, 
they know themselves also not more than just the traditional uh, ways of financing. And if you are using your own network as a company, and that's the whole reason about why crowdfunding, for example, is growing that fast, it's a very good tool for you as a company to validate your product, for example. It's not just for raising money, it's creating a, your own ambassador network of people that uh, are your first, uh, first clients. And you can test and validate your, uh, your, your MVP, your, your first product. And based on that, you also have access to markets because yeah. it helps you to enter new markets without prefer, uh, pre uh, investment in marketing uh, or buying new markets. Mm -hmm. You can just try to reach out to new markets, get some clients that want to buy your product, for example, and that's a way to get access to that market. And these investors are your ambassadors. If you have a few hundred people investing in you as a company in the first phase, they will help you reach out also to other resources and perhaps to corporates that uh, can provide you contracts. Okay. W what's your take on this? What's your... So education, oh. right? Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think education is very important to inspire the new generation of tech entrepreneurs or change makers and stimulate uh, 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 schools and universities, inspire people, be mm. prepared for risk uh, and uh, uh, innovation and, uh, uh, and thinking uh, out the box and, and go to, uh, to, to do something who can change their reality, impact the society. I'm actually just so curious because you're bringing it up now. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the work that you do um, on education and sort of the empowerment of youth in Brazil. Yeah, so uh, we started 21 years ago in the mm. country without internet, inspiring yep. people using technology to be a mm. change maker. Okay. So, uh, and we started building a self-sustainable and self-managed technology schools in low-income communities to teach technology in solving social problems. Wow. So we created the first one in Brazil, but now we have 564 schools through Latin America. And uh, then we have another organization called CDI Apps for Good in uh, London, based mm -hmm. in London, where we have over 700 Apps for Good uh, schools uh, through Europe. Uh, but always teaching uh, people how to uh, uh, using technology uh, to be a change maker and stimulate entrepreneurs' uh, attitudes. Right. Thanks. Um, yeah, maybe uh, I think uh, one thing you didn't mention is places. Uh, I think for the ecosystem to really thrive or, or real build up, uh, having a place. Uh, I mean, on an ongoing basis, is something okay. very important. At least that's what we uh, um, uh, we have experienced ourselves. We've been at the beginning during uh, seven years just uh, uh, organizing events from places to places. Mm -hmm. It was nice building up the community, but uh, when we opened the first co-working in France back in 2007, it was immediately a boom for the ecosystem, for, for, for our community. And uh, we see this uh, everywhere in the world. Um, but then uh, it, it, should be, it shouldn't be just a one place, it should be a, a hub in a network of places, which is once again diversity, that, that's important. So that, that was the thing that I'd like to say. The other thing is maybe um, uh, autonomy. Uh, everything that you've mentioned, in fact, is a way of finding an autonomy for this ecosystem, financially, operationally, etc. And I think that's a key point. No ecosystem can, can, can survive with just one level. They need to find, yes, government support, um, there is a lot in France, there's not much in India or in other places in the world, so you need to go for private uh, subsidies, and at the same time you don't want to be dependent on just one company, so you need to be very diverse in, in terms of your uh, economic model. And so you need to, to find some crowdfunding, crowd equity, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, private, public, uh, membership, any way that you can thrive and continue without being dependent on someone. And maybe this is also true for the leader. The ecosystem and the movement shouldn't be too linked or too, um, yes, too linked to, to the leaders because uh, this is not a movement of some people. It's a, it's a living ecosystem, it's a whole. So if the, if the leader is too present at one time, maybe the, the idea is shifting towards a, a, a dead end. Some, some thinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, what, what I'm wondering now is like, if, if you each had then, let's say, I don't know, a fund of two million, based on everything that you've just said, what would you spend it on? 
to, to sort of to inject into, okay, let's, let's, let's change the game a little bit. Let's say you're launching in a city that doesn't necessarily have a thriving tech ecosystem yet. And you're like, okay guys, you know, your job is to get this thing off the ground. You have 2 million. What would you, what would you do it with it um, in terms of like initial investment? Uh, I don't have the experience with setting up these okay. networks, so for me that's quite uh, hard to say. But uh, I need, of course, I agree. You need to have a good location. You have to need to have mentorship and and so on. Um, but a large part of that money, what I should do is uh, use it for co-financing. Mm -hmm. So make sure with that. Um, Companies that are going to start their uh, the startups that are raising funds or they, they want to grow, uh, that they first have to show that they have potential. So they have to first uh, use their own community, their local community, to raise some funding, and then I will get some additional funding uh, on top of that. That can be 20%, 50%, 80%. It really depends on what the need is there in that, in that industry. But I think that's a model. And if you talk about, you said about governments, uh, governmental support, uh, what the things that I'm doing at the European Commission also is trying to find out how the Euro com European Commission can do much uh, better efficient way of spending the grants they are giving away now uh, to the real startups and that it creates real startups. Yeah, the real startups, <laughs> yes, so that they really make progress with it. Mm. And that's for them really difficult bef because normally they cannot do that one by one because they cannot s see what the potential is of these startups. You need people on the ground. You need to have these experts locally. So I try to convince them to see, okay, how are we going to work together with these local accelerators, incubators? Uh, they can select the right uh, uh, projects and uh, the right entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and do co-financing there. And don't put a lot of restrictions on that, but just automatically, because you have a selection of the good accelerators, you do co-financing there. Okay. Noted. Yeah. yeah. So I uh, I love the uh, the idea of hackathons for goods. Okay. Uh, to stimulate creating a new ecosystem. And three years ago, we in the Center for Digital Inclusion, we had a very nice experience where we organizing the very first startup weekend for good, mm -hmm. startup change makers in the first Islam in Brazil, and we put together 200 uh, people among tech developers, designers, investors, social entrepreneurs, community leaders, young people, to co-create solutions for the most important problems for the Rio de Janeiro slums using technology and social business. And it was really amazing because the media was uh, immediately attracted. We have a lot of, uh, 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 we create awareness about that in, in the Brazilian media. And uh, w in this competition, we award three uh, social business solutions. And the winner uh, won the Inter-America Develop uh, Bank uh, Award for the most innovative uh, social business in Latin America. And then the Forbes Awards for social business. Mm -hmm. So this is really very great. And last year, we did 11 of these startup change makers in 11 cities in six countries. Nice. Do you, do you mind me asking, what are your metrics for success when you do a, a hackathon for social change? Like, how do you know, like, you know, at the end? And especially because you, you guys are a nonprofit, so you always have to show, right, to do reporting. Like, all right, you know, the efficiency is based on... Um, uh, basically, uh, the disruptive idea uh -huh. to impact and changing uh, uh, social problems in the communities, okay. and also uh, the 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 uh, the cooperation and collaboration like between creating investors, the synergies, in, in entrepreneurs, etc. And and then the the social business with launch. That's so. This is this is interesting to me. Um, so I come from a very special part of the tech ecosystem, which is called open data. Um, that's where I got sort of thrown in, into this space. And back in 2013, when people were still talking about open data, it was all about throwing data over the wall, doing hackathons, and then, you know, making like $3 trillion somehow in, in the ecosystem. And this was the big, uh, the big myth at that time. And, uh, and it was really, really hard to kind of move out of that space. And so um, recently I, so last year, so 5x5 five five designed two different, open innovation programs that had sort of hackathon-like components. One was for BNP Paribas, and the other one was for the World Bank. Um, in, in the, for the World Bank, it happened in four countries. In BNP Paribas, it happened in five countries. And for BNP Paribas, we needed to find uh, like 
startups with huge potential. I was bringing on startups that some of them had already raised up to 10 million in, in terms of funding. And then in terms of the World Bank, the countries that we're working in were Kenya, Ghana, Tanzania, and, uh, and Brazil, actually. And what I found really fascinating is that from the outside, the design of the program looks similar. But when we, when we touch into this thing about impact, all the World Bank really cared about was look, are we starting a different kind of dynamic where in the end, the mayor of those cities are going to come back to me and they're going to be like, this is fantastic. I never thought I could work with startups before. Let's do it again next year and maybe we can push this a little further. Whereas for BNP Paribas, clearly it's, you know, it's ROI. Um, in the end, how many turned into pi uh, to prototypes, how many prototypes turned into pilots, how many pilots turned into partnerships, and then how do you, you know, what are the numbers at the end? So, but I think the key factor of success is uh, the, uh, after the, the events. Uh -huh. Because, uh, you know, in these hackathons, less than 1% of the startups surviving for more than six months. Yep. So, the, uh, the, uh, it's really very important we follow up uh, the winners, uh, creating mentorship process, uh, facilitate access to investments, mm -hmm. uh, creating mentor, uh, mentorship and also co-working space. So okay. I, I think that the after event is, is really very important. Well, this is sort of like the cue where Numa comes in then. So do you see yourselves as kind of the, what comes in after the events? Like the, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and your two million, uh, your yeah. two million dollars. <laughs> Well, uh, I have many ideas for using two millions, but uh, uh, let, let's focus on this uh, hackathons thing and uh, this. Um, uh, in fact, uh, actually, we obviously we organize a lot of hackathons in our life uh, in many places, and uh, like many people, uh, I mean, as organizers or uh, people, uh, partners, and even participants, uh, we were a lot disappointed after that because the the, the products uh, nobody didn't make anything about it. Uh, as you said, there is a need for follow-up, um, but follow-up is not follow-up, it's really uh, uh, pushing some um, money, some support, uh, scaling up, and so that means not just follow-up, it's really a, a, a big program. And the other thing we, we understood is that you need to, uh, to prepare it much more before. Uh, it's just not getting people in a, in a room saying, hey, let's save the world. Mm -hmm. It's really first finding a good challenge, a challenge that is setting a problem that's worth solving. Yep. And that's what we worked on. And so to, to get an example, we, we decided to do this on Data City. The idea is we, we gathered people like um, uh, the City Hall of Paris, Cisco, CETEC, Vinci, um, and other guys, Next City, for instance. Uh, typically, the guys that work on these smart cities, uh, this is a, their business, but they are just a part of the business. And a smart city cannot be, uh, the, the issue cannot be tackled by just one. And usually they can't work together because uh, at, at even just being two uh, big companies like that in a room, it's just like uh, you are a supplier or a competitor, but this is, this is something is, is not going well in between them. So we propose to them to be a sort of neutral reactor that made them go around the table and work with the ecosystem. And sorry, I'm long. Oh, no, no, no. So, so just maybe, uh, I don't know um, how many people in the room are familiar with Data City. Could you explain a little bit how it works? So, yeah. so if, so, so you, okay, go ahead. Gathering this uh, private and public institution, uh, understanding what they can provide as an asset and challenges to the ecosystem. So, for instance, the City Hall of Paris can provide places for experimentation. Uh, Cisco can provide data. Uh, Vancy can provide expertise, for instance, like that. Uh, then defining some challenge that we're solving, uh, publishing the challenge to the ecosystem, generating some projects. We received around uh, 200 different projects, uh, on which we select very few, five, because we, we need to focus a lot of resources on them, but the others have been helped in another way. And then, uh, after this sort of uh, hackathon, where we see uh, how the startups, and entrepreneurs, or projects, and provide interesting thing and, and do something with the corporates, we follow up with uh, boot camps, for instance, for one week when we work really together, like a, a sh very short acceleration program, for instance. Uh, also, uh, lots of events and meetings to get on board the experts, uh, people that can have uh, any kind of support to the, to the program, and uh, also a bit of money. I mean, the, the private uh, uh, partners give a bit of money for the for this team to be able to survive just the time of the acceleration program. 
Uh, actually, we will have very uh, soon, in a, in a few weeks, the demo day. Uh, and so we will see the result of this collaboration between the corporates and startups. Uh, but that's, uh, in fact, that's a, a six months long hackathon yeah. with a lot of preparation and, and output. And we want now to bring this globally. So uh, we, the next uh, uh, operation will be uh, jointly in Paris, uh, Mexico, Bangalore, and any city that wants to be part of it. Can I follow up on this? Uh, to you two are running these uh, uh, accelerators for a long time already. You for a for really long time all, and we're talking about um, a healthy ecosystems. So also sustainability on the long run. Do you see also communities being created around these eco ecosystems, these incubators for the long run? And you, the background idea behind it is that if you think about MIT, Harvard, uh, they have big alumni networks that you have these startups, they get some funding, they, get, they grow, they become corporates they, themselves, and they can give back to that community. Do you see that happening also in these startups, the networks that you're starting? Uh, well, uh, basically, uh, at the beginning, uh, Numa is a community place uh, where we more or less give a free place and means for this community to, to evolve. And so we've, been, we've seen many communities start, uh, many die also and fail, but some get out of it. It's like, I don't know, um, uh, OpenStreetMap, for instance, started, uh, the French part started in, uh, in Silicon Santia Numa, and then now it's uh, thousands of people in France. Uh, it's very good. But the thing is, you, you can't decide, uh, I think, you, you can't decide to create a, an ecosystem. You need to uh, adapt to a question, well, to understand what the people need and give it just the means to, to evolve. I have, a, I have a question also. So Numa is a, you know, you have a very special, special kind of role in, in, in the Parisian community. And, um, and we, you know, we were young, relatively young uh, tech ecosystem not too long ago with, you know, people with different kind of ideas on what it means to work with startups. When do you say no? When you know, when you're, there's a corporate and they say, we want to work with you, here's an idea. When do you say no? Well, um, we have for corporates, for example, uh, or even government. But basically, you know, I'm, I'm, you're the center where people are saying like, oh, we really want to work with you. We really want to use your space. We really want access to your communities. Um, what's a good time to say no? Well, I, I would probably res um, synthesize this as um, uh, when they come with a possessive idea, mm -hmm. uh, then we say no. Uh, this, this is, we are sort of uh, intermediaries, uh, let's say facilitators, and so, uh, the trust in our community comes from the fact that we present them with people that we also trust as being uh, uh, that they want just to 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 cooperate and not just uh, buy and attract. So uh, we are very choosy about that. It's very important. Yeah, for me it's uh, about ethical behavior, okay. uh, ethical fiber. So when company would like to using our work just for do their marketing, mm -hmm. no. When governments would like to do partnerships to impact uh, uh, the society, but, uh, 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 but creating some corruption process, no way. Wow. So we, we work, work in Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Mexico, etc. So uh, many times drug dealers uh, would like to support our work. Oh, wow. Yeah, because we are doing good <laughs> in the community, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, but no, in, in but we always say no, no way your partnership with the, uh, in, in this way, right? Ethical behavior attitude is really important. Lesson for the future, always say no to drugs, even when you're in the tech ecosystem. Um, no, I, I, think that, I, think that, I think that's enormously like, interesting, especially now that you bring up marketing, because the truth is that in the sort of young tech ecosystems, when there's money that's being poured in, um, you know, some, sometimes from the corporate side or even from the institutional side, the first budgets, I remember 2012, 2013, 2014, all the first budgets came from marketing and communication. And what we call today departments of innovation are actually, most of them are quite young. Um, I don't know many, even in, in, in large corporates that have more than 20 people, for example, or that have an operational budget uh, that can actually, uh, that, can, that allows investment. Um, to a certain extent. So how, how did you handle that transition? I mean, I think this it's goes out to you absolutely true. At the beginning, when we started the acceleration program and we really needed some, uh, some money to, to start, we, we decided to, to get uh, some corporates on board. And indeed, this was the communication guys that came to us. 
and uh, it was a nightmare at the beginning because <laughs> really they were they wanted the brand everywhere and th there oh was wow. no 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 sense about what they were doing and, and so we're always fighting saying okay this is not really a good thing you can have a logo but not too much <laughs> okay uh, but then wha what is good also it when when a, a company is, is a lot of people and and one way or another you can you get new type of people in on board and they see what's happening and they say oh my god but there is business here i mean there's very interesting people and we could do something with them and so new people come out and, and then this hr it's oh but those guys are oh, just awesome i'd like my people in my company to to act like that and so we we get the hr department on board and so starting with communication we then came to uh, business uh, lines and business managers and then also HR departments. And now it's, you know, innovation has made a long uh, pass since uh, yeah. some, some years. And so now this is a, a full strategy of a company. So we, we are able to connect with many, many different people. Um, the thing is, you, you should always for not forget that company is structure, but you are dealing with people. And mm -hmm. that's what is important. Uh, we, we always, we, we see corporates like startups or, or entrepreneurs on the same foot. Uh, is it, are they interested? Uh, are, they, are they interesting? Sorry. Do they actually uh, have the money? Yeah. <laughs> ca 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 can we help them? Is there any interest to make them work together? Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, is a key decision for us. So I, I'm going to do the bad cop thing here because I know I'm going to let Ronald do the good cop after because I know he's got a really good example. I'm going to give a worst case scenario of uh, kind of work that happens sometimes when you do, you know, sort of work with, uh, with corporates and startups and, um, you know, like community-based um, ecosystems sort of. Uh, some terrible things that, so, so big part of what we do actually involves, audit is a bad word, but sort of like doing diagnostic um, with some of the corporates that we work with to see where they're hitting the wall. Uh, and some of the worst things happen in terms of legal where they accidentally, and this isn't even out of any malicious intent, have clauses that um, you know, claim pr uh, intellectual property because they're standard clauses. Uh, procurement, they start working with a startup and then they realize that they can't pay them. Um, or maybe they can, but maybe eight months after, and then by then they would have burned through uh, all of their funding already. Um, and then you have, of course, like all of the cultural issues where, you know, startups tend to be treated sometimes as, unfortunately, as suppliers, you know, uh, as opposed to thinking in terms of a, a partnership mindset. Now, Ronald had a really good example that I think he wanted to share with us. And like, what, what does it look like when it works? You know, what are some of the things that you've seen that, that are, are, that can be somewhat inspirational for things to come? Yeah, because what, what I want to, 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 to drop here is uh, we are now talking about corporates, corporates that we need to help them because <laughs> we, they, they don't know how to work together with startups. They, we need to help them create a community. But of course, there are already a lot of corporates that have their own ecosystem, they have their own community already, and they are open, they are sharing, they are working together with a large group of, of partners, for example. And two interesting examples are Google and Alibaba. Mm -hmm. Of course, they are also quite new organizations, but they are growing really fast, and one of the reasons they are growing really fast is they, that they are wor working together with a lot of partners. Yes. As an example of Google, Google has a very large group of, uh, of uh, partners, and these are, most of the time, very small companies, very small SMEs. And the problem for these companies is uh, getting some funding to grow. And they don't need an accelerated program, they don't need to have an incubating co-working space, they have a space already, they work, they grow, they sell advertisement, they are a web development agency, nothing fancy, high tech, fast growing, but they just want to uh, become a bit bigger. Um, for uh, all these companies, it's very difficult to, to, to have access to finance. So what Google did, Google has a lot of uh, money on the shelf. They don't use it uh, for anything. So what they did, they created kind of a fund themselves, used an online platform, Lending Club, uh, is an online peer-to-peer -peer, uh, platform, uh, earmarked the money uh, to, to their partners. Their partners were able to get a very uh, cheap loan through Lending Club uh, to grow their business. And of course there are some defaults, uh, and in the end perhaps Google is not making any money with that, uh, with, that fu with that fund. But of course they are funding their whole ecosystem, and their ecosystem is growing. Do, do you remember what that's called? I mean, I think some people here might want to Google it, actually, to sort of look into it. Do you know if it had a name, that program? Um, it, it doesn't have a specific name. Okay. It's just Google works together with Lending Club okay. to provide funding for their own partnerships. Right. So, 
So that's one example. And the other quick example I want to share, share is with Alibaba. Mm -hmm. And Ab Alibaba is a big marketplace, uh, as you all know. And what they did is they created also a fund, but uh, not for their partners, for, but for U.S. retailers. All these small U.S. retail uh, companies that created the credit line, they could get some funding uh, from Alibaba to buy products from Chinese uh, small companies to, to distribute and sell again in, in the US. And of course, that created a lot of uh, additional transactions on their own platform. So just to think out of the box, to think about as a corporate, sometimes you, c you have already a community, you have a network, and you can support it. And sometimes it's very simple. You have some funds in your treasury department, use it for this. Uh, and that uh, creates a lot of additional growth for you as an organization. The, so, so the term that I heard that, that, that stuck quite a lot as well is this term which is uh, building an ecosystem. So when you're in an innovation consultancy like us, um, you know, most of the requests are like, yes, we would like to build a, you know, an innovation ecosystem around what we're doing. We would like to build an ecosystem around the Internet of Things. We'd like to build an ecosystem around FinTech and so on and so forth. Do you think that ecosystems can be built from the ground up? Or do, you know, is there a way of, of engineering it to a certain extent? Or do you believe that this is something that is, has to be messy, it has to be organic, and you just sort of have to throw something over the wall and cross your fingers? Um, maybe, maybe Fred? Um, well, I, I know many corporations that want to do that. Uh, definitely, they, they, they decide they have a product mainly, and they want to create an ecosystem out of that. That's particularly hard uh, because an ecosystem is built with people that that has a need or uh, wants to do something. You can't decide from them what you want to do. Uh, so uh, it can be done, but it requires a lot, a lot of money and uh, a lot of support on the long term. So uh, I would say this is not the easiest way, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> uh, and, and particularly because uh, uh, good ecosystems uh, happen uh, at the right time, at the right moment. Uh, they are here to solve an issue. Uh, if, this is the only, the, if the issue is yours and nobody else, then it's very difficult to attract people around that. I'm sorry, I'm not very specific there, but um, it's difficult. I can't really say uh, the, the names uh, of this. But. Yeah, I think it's possible creating an ecosystem. And for CDI, when we start CDI with the first project about digital inclusion or digital empowerment, through our exemplarity, we inspire all of the society uh, to working with technology to do good. So uh, after three, four years of the, the CDI working, governments in Brazil start to do uh, digital inclusion programs, and then companies, and then other NGOs, and then other governments or other organizations in Latin America start to do uh, the same. So uh, I think through exemplarity, uh, when we show impact, we can inspire uh, the society uh, to, uh, to creating something new. And Bill Drayton, the, the Ashoka founder, he uh, always say about the biggest power of the social entrepreneur is not the direct results for their social enterprise, but the power to influence all of the society to move. And I'm really interested in what you're saying, especially because especially you're talking about Brazil and you're talking about Latin America. And that kind of reminds me of the fact that every time talk, people talk about a great habitat for entrepreneurs, they always talk about Silicon Valley, right? And there have been there's like tons of literature that's out there dissecting why it's a success, what is it, you know, what can we learn from it, how do we build our own Silicon Valley in, in, in our own countries. And um, so this is, might be a closing question to a certain extent, but what do, you, what do you think about this obsession with this one kind of perfect ecosystem? And two, based on your own experiences in the countries that, that you have strong ties with, what are some of the alternative models that we've seen and that we can look to for inspiration? I think first, it is not a perfect model. I think there's a lot of things uh, that are not uh, working really right there. And of course, there are some unicorns. And if you look into the financial returns, perhaps it's a good model. And But if you focus more on social returns, um, there are a lot of other activities or a lot of other ecosystems that are much more successful. Um, what's your favorite? <laughs> uh, what's my favorite? Um, 
of course, okay, then I say close at home, is that we, we see in, in Amsterdam, for example, we see a very thriving community uh, now around uh, social finance. So social entrepreneurship, social finance, different way of, uh, of financing growth. And that's a very big ecosystem because government regulators are also into it. They see the potential there. They are not going to regulate it uh, very strictly uh, at the start, for example. Uh, there's a lot of innovation going on with developers. We have a very multicultural, uh, Amsterdam is very multicultural. We have 200 different nationalities there. And the best uh, developers are coming there. So they are finding out new models of, uh, for, yeah, for financial innovation. So what is an anti-Silicon Valley like about Amsterdam the most, do you think? The anti is that I think uh, because of the restrictions on uh, venture capital, uh, of course that's one of the first examples what people always talk about with Silicon Valley, easy access to venture capital, is that we find different ways. And you see that you can create different uh, uh, governance models, uh, different uh, structures. You see a very high growth in cooperative models, uh, business models. Uh, social ventures uh, because they don't have to focus on financial returns for the for the venture capitalists uh, as an investor in in the US every company needs to grow fast 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 have to go to an exit really quick mm -hmm. um, and if you don't have that financial uh, motivation you find other motivations yeah. <laughs> okay and it's Are not sustainable right and it's yeah. not sustainable now yeah and uh, now in Silicon Valley, how many companies are trying to attract uh, women, uh, uh, p color, people? And th this is really important. And recently, Daubert did uh, a, c a consultant project for Intel, uh, proving uh, with companies who in invest in, uh, in w uh, women for the, the leadership and the color people are, are uh, potentially more profitable. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this, this is really interesting, uh, uh, considering that uh, factors also. You think Brazil's doing a good job on that? No, I think Brazil is not doing a good uh, job. Okay, I thought it maybe. Okay. But you have, uh, we had some initiatives like in, in Belo Horizonte, in Minas Gerais, with some initiatives to s support startups. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some uh, capitals who are doing uh, a nice job, but we have, we have big problems and challenge with governments and and uh, and funding, right? Okay. Wow, so you realize you're going to be talking about France for our last two minutes, right? So no pressure. Just don't make us look too bad. <laughs> um, no, well, you, we, we were very inspired by the U.S. Uh, I mean, we created the co-working 2007 because it was created in San Francisco in maybe 2005. We created the first acceleration program, very much inspired by White Combinator or Techstar. Uh, no, I think after 10 or 15 years, we've invented something different based on our territory, based on our European culture. And uh, that no, we, we try to get it global and, and, and reverse it to, to the world. And that's why when we decided to go global, we decided not to go to the US or not to UK, those places where there's massive uh, amount of competitors, of uh, people, and also a strong culture that is very difficult to move now. Uh, but we find in India, in Mexico, in those booming places where there is lots of needs, lots of demands, uh, energy, um, uh, what, what we found in France, and we want to help them in this way. Uh, so I, I think maybe the, the difference is in the meaning. Um, uh, my, my view is, and it's changing, I mean, people in San Francisco is, are really thinking about what, what, what are we going, where, uh, where are we going with that? Uh, what, what is the meaning of all this uh, nonsense uh, pacing with lots of money to grow fast and, and destroy industries and replace it by new startups that will become the new corporates, you know? Um, and so I think we are much driven in Europe and in all these places in India and Mexico uh, by meaningful issues and problems that we want to solve. And that's probably what uh, makes us different. And also that uh, we don't necessarily want uh, big winners that just are the best and, uh, uh, at all. Uh, we, we just want uh, the, the overall economy uh, to grow as a whole. And I think this is the main difference. Yeah, that, was, that was a great conclusion. So that is the, those are the last words we're going to hear from the panel. Uh, our time is up. If anybody has any questions, uh, we are going to be in the terrace over at the end, so you can just, you know, ping us, um, 
buy us a beer. <laughs> but, you know, we can just talk about this a little bit later. You can ask all of the sort of gloves off, you know, non-stage friendly questions as well, if you like. So uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> it thank was you. Great thank you so much. Thank you.